Setzen Sie sich. Guten Abend, ich bin Sani minton Bedders vom Economist. Willkommen zu diesem offenen Forum des WEFs über die Zukunft der Eurozone. Solidarität oder Dominanz? Now I'm going to speak English because I'm actually English um, and the conversation will be in English, but I think you all have headsets if necessary. There is, there is general agreement, I think, that the Eurozone is out of the emergency room. Last year, the sense that this meeting at the WEF was, would the Eurozone survive? We felt as though it was a, a crisis moment and things have improved in the financial markets. But if you look around Europe in the real economy, things are still very, very tough. The economies of the periphery of Europe are shrinking. The Eurozone unemployment rate is over 11 percent, 18 million people out of work. Particularly young people have been hit very hard. So there is a huge to-do list in Europe. How does the Eurozone grow again? How does it regain competitiveness? What do you do about austerity? How do you boost growth? And we're going to talk about that this evening. And we're also going to talk about the politics of the Eurozone. Is the Eurozone, not to put too fine a point on it, run by Germany? Is it dominance? Is it solidarity? Is it the integration and solidarity that was part of the European dream? And what I hope we're going to do, we have an absolutely spectacular paddle here of people who are shaping the future of Europe. And I will introduce them briefly in a second. And we will have a conversation amongst the panel. And then I'd like to open it up halfway through the evening to questions from all of you. So welcome to all of you. And just brief introductions. And you all deserve much longer introductions than I'm going to give you. But you, because you're all, I hope you all have the bios of these very eminent politicians. But I'm just going to go now in order. On your far right there, is Angel Gurria, the Secretary General of the OECD in Paris. Next to... <laughs> and he waved, yes. <laughs> Next to Angel is Minister Luis de Guindos Jurado, Minister of Economic Affairs and Competitiveness of Spain. <laughs> Welcome. Next to him is Guido Westerwelle, Ministry of Foreign, Minister of Foreign Affairs from Germany. Welcome, thank you for joining us. Here is Vittorio Grilli, Minister of Economics and Finance in Italy. Never have so many finance ministers sat, I think, together. <laughs> Next to you, another minister, Stephen Van Ackere. I Have I pronounced your name nearly right? I hope so. Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Finance in Belgium. And Sustainable Development. And Sustainable, I am so sorry. Deputy <laughs> Minister, Prime Minister, Minister of Finance and Sustainable Development. I may ask you to define that at some point. Um, and finally, Robin Niblett, last but not least, my uh, fellow Brit, who is director of Chatham House, which is the, I think, certainly one of the best, if not the best, think tank in Britain. So welcome to all of you. And let's start, let's start with the policies. Let's start with where we go from now. And I think I'm going to start with the two ministers who are at the, uh, at the coal face of this. And Minister Grilly, I'm going to start with you. Is there a tension between austerity and growth? I keep hearing here on Davos, we must have smart growth, inclusive growth, and smart austerity. Is that actually possible? And is there a tension between the two? And if there is, how do you balance it? Well, thank you. Uh, of course, uh, there is a tension uh, in the short term, uh, for sure. And, uh, but I, would, I don't like to call that uh, austerity. I rather call it uh, uh, fiscal responsibility. Uh, and, I, and I think it is calling the right way also give the idea of what it means and why it is necessary. And I think that uh, when you look at potential new growth engines in Europe and in the euro area, you have first to, gener to create the preconditions. And I think I see two preconditions that are basics to regenerate the credibility and confidence that people and market should have in Europe and which is a necessary uh, ingredient to really restart the economy on a different basis. And one of the major preconditions is fiscal responsibility, uh, which means uh, to me for an advanced economy to realize that the dynamic of deficits uh, that are possible in a high growth economy uh, are not po longer possible in an advanced economy where growth, <coughs> if you are very good, is still too three percent if you are really, really good. And before, in the euro area, we sort of faced the fact that we had to have clear responsibility, and uh, that means uh, balanced budgets, basically. And to switch from a condition of 
large deficits, growing debt into a condition where you run in a disciplined way, balanced budget, that means uh, changing the, uh, at least in the short term, uh, uh, demand in the economy. Is there, can I just push you a bit on that though? Is there a risk that if you tighten, you'll cut your deficits too fast, you have, you're in recession and so your debt burden gets bigger and you are actually running backwards? I, and I, mean, I think you're right, uh, you know, like the math works that, that way. And I think this is, to me, a, an avoidable price that you have to pay. Of course, different countries can have different speed of adjustment, but sometime, and I am convinced in my country, we didn't have much of an option. Uh, our, at least when my government uh, came in uh, uh, more than a year ago, the first was to stabilize our own sovereign markets. And stabilizing sovereign market was to give back confidence to the markets that Italy was a credible debtor. And so we had to really go and reestablish uh, really a sound public finance policy. And we didn't have the choice, can we go slower, fast? We had to go fast uh, because we were facing a potential deep financial crisis. So, uh, of course, if somebody, some other country have luxury of choice, uh, uh, maybe, <laughs> of course, <laughs> that kind of trade-off uh, uh, maybe actually is a, a, a one that you want to exploit. But uh, some country, and mine, I think. You had no choice. Sense. What about Minister Digindos? Can I ask you a similar question, which is, you know, Spain has, has done a lot, probably a lot more to do, but you have the, the confidence of financial markets is coming back, but there is a huge gap between that and what's going on in your real economy. Mm -hmm. So do you see the ingredients for Spain to grow in this environment? Well, I am in broad agreement with what uh, Vittorio has just said. Uh, I think that it's impossible to, to grow without creating the perception that you have sustainable and credible public finances over the medium term. Um, if you don't uh, create this perception, I think that uh, the rest of your policies are going to be totally useless. So I think that uh, is something that we have to do. I do not see uh, uh, adults uh, uh, between fiscal policy and growth. I think that uh, you know this tension is an artificial uh, sometimes uh, discussion that uh, has been created because some people uh, try to attack the fundamentals of the Eurozone. And I think that, uh, well, we have to, to bear in mind that when you have a, a monetary, a common monetary policy, you need a fiscal framework. And I remember the times in 2003, I am a little bit older in the, uh, the Eurogroup than, than other people, when Germany and France breached the rules. And I think that many of the consequences that we are suffering now are the consequence of that decision. Uh, you know, because Germany and France were the countries that were the real reference, the real anchor countries for the monetary union, for the future of the Eurozone. Reaching the rules, uh, if uh, the, the umpires, if the referees breach the rules, it's very difficult afterwards to demand to other countries as Greece, you know, to, 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 to stick to the rules. So I think that this is something that we have learned in the, in the Eurozone. We are uh, learning by doing, if you allow me to say. Uh, we have made mistakes. We had flaws. The decision-making process in the Eurozone is difficult. But I, what I can assure you is that uh, uh, behind and underneath uh, the Eurozone, the Euro, there is a lot of political will. And I see the, the Euro not only as an economic or financial instrument, that it is an economic and financial uh, uh, driver, but much more as uh, you know, a political uh, uh, component of the future of Europe. And in that regard, I think that uh, you know, this is something that we should not undervalue. And this, I think that sometimes uh, we are missing the point with respect to the Eurozone. That's very interesting. And we'll get to the politics of this in the second half of the discussion, because I think that is a very important part of it. But just to make sure I'm, I'm clear, you, your, your view is that the, the, the broad policy framework, obviously, that Spain has, you, you would think it is the right one, but you are now on track to grow again. Mm -hmm. We are fully on track of to, to, to grow again. I think that we are correcting our imbalances. We had uh, a lot of imbalances in the private sector, in the public finances in the banking industry. And I think that uh, Europe is giving a uh, helping hand to, 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 to Spain. And I think that it's giving uh, credibility, it's giving confidence. And I am totally convinced that over the next uh, quarters, 
Spain is putting the foundations and sowing the seeds of growth. And I think that uh, you know, it will be, let's say, uh, you know, a successful story of adjustment in the Eurozone and that it will show that uh, despite all the difficulties, despite all the mistakes that we have made, at the end of the day, what, is really, uh, what really prevails is the political will to continue creating a single currency. Thank you. I'm going to turn now to you, Minister uh, Van Akev, because we'll have the three ministers to start with, since you're, you're doing this. Do you, from your perspective, you haven't been in quite the same situation as the previous two speakers, but is the uh, policy mix in the euro area the right one? For, to promote, let's use the second half of your title, sustainable development. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mentioned sustainable not because I'm so idle that for you to, to mention my <laughs> whole title, but, 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 but because uh, most of the time people do not associate sustainability with finance. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> when, uh, when Luis is, is, is absolutely right when he's uh, explaining that every country needs to follow its own path, it's true that as far as Belgium is concerned, this was the very good proof that a word that has not been... Yeah, you, you, talk, talk, you spoke about confidence. But trust is one of the key elements to get the, the actors in the economy back on their feet again. And why did we have to go very quickly after a, a period of more than 540 days of caretaker government? You know that Belgium had a very long period of quasi-crisis in the Anglo-Saxon press, people wrote there is no government in Belgium. That was not exactly true. There was a government, uh, but it was caretaking. We like caretaking. to simplify. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, uh, we went to Libya with the caretaker government and we took care of the European presidency with the caretaker government. So the government was capable of, of the doing some things. But if, as far as the fiscal consolidation was concerned, people felt that uh, Belgium was not on the move. And in November of 2011, 10-year yield uh, interest rates, they were at 5.8%, which was, as far as I'm concerned, irrational if you looked at the fundamentals, but they were the expression of a lack of confidence, of trust. Uh, by doing uh, an effort on the fiscal consolidation level of 18 billion euro, which for my country is a lot of money, it's, uh, we're talking about 3 or 4% of GDP, and taking decisions in one year's time on two budgetary years, confidence came back and the, the interest rate dropped from 5.8 to 2.2. Why do I say this? Because I want to give an answer to your question of is there a contradiction between growth and what you called austerity, but I think that uh, Vittorio is right when he calls it uh, uh, fiscal responsibility. It's also about sending the message that we have understood that uh, getting your act together on the, on the budgetary level is crucial to, to restore confidence. So I think that the, the policy mix of today, let's not underestimate the participation of some of the political messages of Herman van Rompuy and, and the leaders of, of the European Union, and also some messages coming from the ECB that have contributed to, let's say, an atmosphere in which the different countries could follow their path towards uh, fiscal consolidation. And I think everybody on his level needs to contribute. And it is true, the historical reference to the past, we have made mistakes in trying to be a monetary union without having the, the, the rules on the, on, on, on the fiscal level uh, accompanied by real teeth. But that, that is a mistake that we have corrected. And it, it's important that by now the world sees that uh, we have been learning from our mistakes and that uh, these episodes uh, to, to which uh, Luis uh, made reference, they are definitely uh, part of the past. So we, we're going to keep, not only get our act together, but keep our act together. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gouria, I'm going to turn to you now before I turn to Mr. Vestavella. And you, you run an organization which is, if you will, the kind of global umpire of all of this. No organization has done more work on what creates growth, and indeed you've done a lot of work on fiscal austerity, fiscal responsibility, <laughs> and uh, when you hear the three ministers here, are you encouraged by what Europe is doing? Are we going in the right direction in Europe? Does, this, does the mix need to be changed? I'm very encouraged. Um, the, uh, the question, it, it's really a false dilemma, this question of you know, austerity. It's typically cast in terms of austerity against growth, etc. It's a false dilemma because you have to do both. The question is, how much of each do you do? You know, in a 100% package, do you do 70-30, do you do 50-50, 50-50, 50-50, 50-50, 50-50, 50-50, 50-50, 50-50, 50-50, 50-50, 50-50, 50-50, 50-50, 50-50, 50-50, 50-50
or do 99 and 1, you know? And, and that depends on each country's situation. Uh, the, some of the countries here had to go and give a very, very a strong signal, almost a brutal signal to the markets. They ran out of time in a way. In, in some cases because they deferred the, the, the reforms and in some countries because the markets caught up with them. In any case, you had to shake that off. You had to say to the markets, hey, listen, you know, focus on the reforms that I'm doing and also the, the budgetary question is very intractable. The markets have now gotten not only very uh, uh, drastic in their judgment, they sometimes act against their own uh, best interest. And they just penalize, they, they punish you instantaneously the moment they see weakness. They are like uh, heat-seeking missiles. <laughs> this is weakness-seeking missiles, you know. So the, what happens is countries have to give uh, signals and, and a message of strength, of willingness, and also of governance in order to deliver the policies. And this is what we are seeing now. I think some of the reforms that uh, Italy or Spain have taken uh, are going to put them back into the competitiveness, into the productivity race, uh, while I have to say, uh, in, the, in the last uh, 10 years, uh, productivity in the case of Germany, for example, uh, has been uh, higher than the wages. Hmm? Productivity has been higher than the wages. In the case of Spain, or in the case of Italy, even in the case of France, in the case of Portugal, in the, in the, face, in the case of Ireland, the wages rose faster than productivity. Therefore, what happened is the unit labor cost, as the economists call it, uh, meaning the competitiveness of an economy uh, lost. And this is why you started to have these enormous differences between you know, Germany and some of the other countries, because it was, in a way, relatively cheaper to produce, and therefore in Germany rather than the other countries. So what's happening now? There's a correction. And this correction has to take place. And part of that took place in the context also of big deficits had to be corrected. What we're seeing now is a necessary, indispensable correction in order to bring convergence in the uh, euro area. Thank you. That's actually a very, very great, good segue to the question I want to ask of Minister Westerwelle here, because we've, we've talked a lot about from the, the ministers of the countries in, in, in uh, let's say, the, the less than solid core of Europe. And you, I want to know whether this agenda, this reform agenda is something that happens in southern Europe or is it actually something that you need to do too? I think everyone has to do it. Uh, there's no doubt about it that uh, the question for everything, for our success in the world, uh, for the question of our, competitive, our competitiveness in the world in times of globalization, it is important that uh, we all uh, will do our homework and um, will work on our structural reforms. But can I just, I mean, I'm being simplistic here, but how can, competitiveness is a zero-sum game at some level. How can everyone improve their competitiveness? Well, I don't think that this is a zero-sum game. I, I, I really disagree. Good. I Good. think... Uh, <laughs> so, um, if, if Spain and Italy Thank you. Are, now it's my turn. Of course. <laughs> just to clarify this. <clears throat> Um, well, I think the first I want to say is I, I would like to the surprise of uh, maybe some who are here in this hall, I would like to agree completely to what has been said about the use of the word austerity. I hate this word austerity because it has a totally different, diff different meaning in English if you use austerity or if you use it in German, like Austerität. It has very bad and brutal vibrations if you use it in English, and it sounds more elegant if you use it in Austerität. In, in German, it is more discipline. So I use the word fiscal discipline. Germans love disciplines. And this is why I use this word fiscal discipline. And this fiscal discipline is absolutely one precondition for growth. So the idea, growth is 
has only one cause, or you need for gross deficit spending, or this or that, from my point of view, it's absolutely too simple. Um, I, I don't want to ruin the agenda, but I think it is, it is obvious in this crisis that you need three pillars to overcome this euro crisis or this debt crisis in Europe and to create new growth. The first one is fiscal discipline because you cannot, you cannot solve a debt crisis by making it easier to take up new debts. And if we continue on this path, it's obvious where we end. We, if we have too many debts in our national budgets, we will become slaves to the financial industries, we will become slaves of the markets, and this is what we have to avoid. It will kill every political opportunity, every political uh, responsibility at home. The second is solidarity. We need solidarity. We are a community in the European Union. This is what I always to uh, tell some friends, northern parts of Europe. Um, to whom it may concern. <laughs> um, solidarity, if you are part of a community, of course you know that you have to stand united in better days or even in uh, bad days. So I think solidarity is the second pillar. And the third pillar is growth. But growth is not the result of deficit spending, is not the result of new debts, Growth in our times, in times of globalization, is the result of competitiveness, is the result of structural reforms, and this is the reason why I answered your uh, question with a clear yes. Everyone, every day, every country in the European Union has to work permanently on own competitiveness, otherwise we will not survive with our European lifestyle in times of globalization. It is so short that we will see in India three, time, three times more of citizens like in the whole European Union together. I mean, what we see at the moment is the early bird, uh, the changes in the world. And therefore, I think we have to stay together in the European Union. We have to work day by day on our competitiveness. Otherwise, um, I think um, we really will lose our lifestyle and we will lose the capability to protect our values and our freedom and our liberty here in Europe. Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> can, I, can I just ask you, I, I, I doubt anyone in this room, and you put it extremely eloquently, but I doubt anyone agrees, disagrees with the idea that each country should be doing as much as it can to boost its sustainable growth, whether you call that competitiveness or whatever you call it. But do you think the components of that agenda are different in different parts of Europe? And particularly, what are the things that you should be doing as Germany, and are they different to what you are as being done in other countries? Of course, I mean, one size fits all will never work in, in uh, such an important uh, European Union and uh, in this variety. And our variety is also our our advantage because uh, it creates creativity, which is very good if you want to compete with other regions uh, worldwide. So I don't see this negative, I see this very positive. Of course we have to uh, look to historical backgrounds, or to the infrastructure and to this and to that. We have to differentiate, there is no doubt about it. But um, I think there are two issues or two political areas which is decisive and which will become more and more crucial for every single country, for every region worldwide, and especially here in this very well-educated Europe. The first one is education. Education, science, research, investments in education. This is the investment uh, into the future. Because, I mean, we do not have raw materials here in Europe, not too much. We do not have uh, too much fossil energy or, or, or raw materials. We do not have raw materials under our feet. Our natural resources is not under our feet. Our natural resources is between our ears in Europe. So be smart, wise, and, and, and uh, intelligent 
Creativity, this is, I think, uh, the result of a good education system. So the, I think the competition of education systems will be absolutely crucial in our uh, new world. And the second uh, pillar, or the second answer is, which is, which we all have in common, education, science, research, in times of globalization, to enable the young generation for the new time of globalization, and the second is energy. Energy is becoming more and more important for all over the world, and this is why we have to be um, smart early enough uh, when we see, um, for example, what we can do with uh, renewable energies uh, and many other things. Uh, we should be uh, the first uh, continent who has uh, good ideas about this and who will sell one day the new technologies worldwide. Thank you. Robin, I'm going to turn to you last as the, uh, my fellow Anglo-Saxon here. Um, whether we, and I don't, let's not get into a taxonomy, but we're going to agree to call it now fiscal responsibility, right? Fiscal discipline, fiscal responsibility, whatever it is. Um, you've listened to this discussion. Are you, uh, and, and, and we have a similar <coughs> debate going on in the UK, but do you, do you listen to this and do you think that the, the policymakers here are on the right track with the Eurozone and it will start growing again and this agenda is the right one? Look, put simply, um, I think there has to be austerity in Europe, including the UK and throughout the Eurozone. The EU is not the US. We can't just grow our way out of a very large debt. Um, we don't have the demographic profile. To be frank, we don't have the open market uh, quite yet. Uh, to be able to do it, and so whereas, and, and the currencies as well, whereas the U.S. has some flexibility to grow its way fairly rapidly out of high debt, I think in Europe it's a much, much bigger gamble, and this point has been made clearly, I think, by each of the ministers. What worries me is that it's, it's easier to focus on austerity than it is on structural reform for many governments. You know, austerity is simple. You know, we raise some taxes, we cut spending, um, and then we talk about structural reform. Uh, but structural reform, and I think Guido Vestavella put it very clearly, has some very difficult paths to it. It's about three things. It's about the environment for doing business. And he touched, I think, on key points, uh, infrastructure, energy, education. Uh, it's about labor laws. I think in many cases these are now being undertaken. The ease of getting people into business, into employment. Uh, the EU has not just got high employment, it's got huge underemployment. Not enough women uh, uh, in workforce in large parts of the south of Europe. Not enough elderly people in many cases uh, uh, in, in, in the workforce. It's also about the ease of doing business. There are some shocking statistics about where certain EU countries stand on ease of registering a business, you know, literally getting your electricity bill set up, setting up a company. There is still some, frankly, third world type bureaucracy uh, that exists in Europe. It's tied in a little bit with, with the structure of business. But the most important one, I think, is the ease of, of, of the, sorry, the scope of doing business. The scope. The EU is 70% GDP as services. Now, here I'm going to sound a little bit like a British angle here. Competitiveness is not just being able to all be like Germany and export top-end cars. Uh, uh, and it's not just about competitiveness in terms of getting the human capital ready. The human capital has to be doing something. And the doing cannot all be manufacturing. The service sector remains, as Mario Monti pointed out before he be became prime minister, 70% of EU, EU GDP, only 20% of it is open in the single market. And no one is really taking it, this bull by the horns and opening up an area uh, where people could really do business. Why? Because politically, to take on lawyers, to take on the transport sector, to take on communications, to take on insurance, these are really difficult things to do politically. But if you don't do that, you won't create the employment opportunities, however competitive you are. My last point I'd make is, is about the concept of solidarity. I, it, wor it worries me a bit, uh, Guido Vestavella said it very well, I think in Germany still more broadly, for some people, solidarity is collective responsibility. Do like we do. We should all do like each other, and preferably, as Germany is doing quite well, uh, do like us. Um, and, and that, you know, it may be doable up to a point, um, but clearly we're going to need... <laughs> We're going to need uh, solidarity and hard cash as well, a little way along the line. I, I, think, I think Minister Westervelle deserves a response. There is solidarity. <laughs> do it like we do. Wie es in Deutschland gemacht wird. We are in Davos. And in Davos, I want to quote Thomas Mann. 
um, just to repeat what I said about education. Um, That's not the question I asked. Uh, I, I, come, I come precisely to your question. And Thomas Mann was it who said, um, ich möchte kein deutsches Europa, sondern ich möchte ein europäisches Deutschland. I'm not seeking for a German Europe. I, I want to have a, a European Germany. And this is my answer can, to against all these cliches and stereotypes. Can I then quote you, We are a very Nash. modest nation. Can, can I, that's, that is a great line from, from Thomas Mann. Can I just uh, ask you to then uh, respond to... But we to do a, not hide our opinions. I believe it was Timothy Garton Ash, a British historian, who said recently, using uh, Thomas Mann, he said, what we now have is a European Germany in a German Europe. Is Germany running European policy? That's too complicated policies? for my simple English. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll put it very straight then, because I, what I'd like to do, that was actually a great discussion on, on the balance of policies. Let's move now to a slightly perhaps more contentious topic, which is the politics of all of this. And I, I'll give you a break now, perhaps. Minister de Guindos, <laughs> where is policy being made for Spain? Is it being made only in Madrid? Is it being made in Madrid and Brussels? Is it being made in Madrid, Brussels and Berlin? Well, I think that is a package. Uh, it's a package because uh, we have uh, given in uh, sovereignty. Well, uh, you know, we have, uh, we have uh, transferred our monetary policy to the European Central Bank. We have lost uh, the possibility of modifying our nominal exchange rate. But uh, the point that I would like to make is that uh, uh, in Spain, for instance, what we have realized uh, over the last uh, three, four years, that we have had a lot of sufferings for the population, a lot of difficulties, and we have taken a lot of, of tough measures, is that whenever we see that uh, uncertainties, doubts, jittery about the future of uh, 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 the, the, the Eurozone, about the possibility of having the Euro falling apart, immediately Spain suffers. And the, the other way around, whenever we have uh, a reduction in uncertainty, a reduction about the doubts of the future of the project of the Eurozone, immediately uh, Spain takes advantage of this situation, and it's quite visible. We see, for instance, how our yield spreads start to narrow. So, it's curious, no? Because sometimes we have this discussion about uh, ONT, austerity, etc. But uh, what we see is that uh, whenever we, s we, we start to realize that there is much more political underpinning beneath uh, the project of the Eurozone, immediately Spain goes ahead. And I think that this is something that we have to take into consideration uh, because I think that sometimes this uh, possibility or this uh, uh, you know, uh, discussion about putting a dots austerity versus growth is something that is quite detrimental to the, to the, to the political agenda. But to, to, to answer, to, to, to reply to your question, what I have to say is that uh, in Spain, we make our own policy, but we are fully convinced that we have to share part of this policy with our partners, because our partners uh, is part of the future of the European economy, and not only the European economy, that's part also of Spain. So we feel profoundly pro-European, despite the fact that sometimes we have to take, we have taken tough measures uh, that have created difficulties for the population, but they know that uh, the more Europe, the better for Spain. So in, to, to use the two words that are in the title of this session, solidarity or domination, you would, you would say the former no, but I was think more that accurate. Is, uh, you know, uh, is neither solidarity nor domination. I think that we are on the same boat. I think that uh, you know, whenever uh, Italy makes things right, and, he, and Italy recently has made a lot of things right, that's good for Spain. And when Spain uh, makes things right, that's good for Italy for Belgium and for the rest of the, of the Eurozone. This is not a question of so only solidarity. Solidarity is a different, a different concept in my view. What I see is that we have a common interest, that we have a common will, that we have a common destiny, uh, and I think that uh, to share this project is worthwhile, despite the difficulties that we might uh, undertake in the short term.
Thank you. Minister Greedy, let me pose the, basically the same question to you. And Italy, is, you have done a huge amount. You have an election coming up in your country. The question of um, the legitimacy of this and, and where policy is, is policy being dictated, is it not being dictated, is in some sense a sort of subtext of this. What's your, is your sense that, or where would you come out on this solidarity or domination and where is, where, have we got the right institutional basis for policy to be made? Yeah, that's a question that is important to answer, but I think Louise has put it in the, in the, in the right uh, context. I think it's not a, an alternative solidarity and domination, but it's a question of success. And I think we have to have a successful model in Europe. And uh, I think that what it looks like somehow tension across country about decision to take, I think is uh, a consequence, is a reasonable consequence of different uh, uh, level uh, of success <laughs> that right now different countries have. So we have now in the Eurozone especially uh, clear differences uh, of, uh, uh, across country, but we, I think nobody is uh, uh, so naive to believe that they can thrive and have success alone with the other country in the Euro area not sharing that success. So I think uh, right now the diversity of initial position makes that debate uh, uh, look like, well, there is huge disagreement, uh, uh, but I, I think that what we have all in mind is we have to have in Europe a common growth model, a common social and economic uh, uh, that's infrastructure and structure to guarantee Europe to be successful in the world. And what we have to do is converge over that model, and I think the big question is what is that model? And I think we already heard some major ingredients, and I think those are ingredients. Some of that we already basically all agreed. And uh, mm -hmm. we talk about uh, fiscal responsibility, and that we all agree that is a precondition. I think I would add financial uh, stability. That's a, you know, the big crisis show that without stable financial market and well-regulated and functioning financial market is very difficult. And I think we also agree on that. And this process of, let's call it banking union in a simplified way, we just show that there is a lot of agreement that we have to pursue uh, sort of well-integrated uh, and regulated uh, common financial markets. Then there is a third one uh, uh, that uh, is we have to, through structural reform, reform Europe. Uh, and there is a more difficult. Uh, I think that most of the reform we uh, all agree uh, that uh, are necessary. Political implementation is very difficult <laughs> in some cases. But I think one has to have in mind that regaining competitiveness means really changing in some country deeply the structure of our society, which means changing how the private sector, and of course, I think was very right shifting uh, or at least making the service sector much more competitive and integrated in Europe. We are leaving on the table a lot of money because without integrating in a huge service sector, European service sector, we are really not being very efficient. But then it's about restructuring our public sector. We know that in some country, the public sector is too large, inefficient, and built on somehow not having thought through very well what kind of incentive you put in the economy when you structure, for example, entitlement program, taxation program a certain way. And I want to add one of the problems that we have is right there. We have a huge demographic problem that translates in aging population and in young people not being well used in our economy early. I mean, my country and other country have huge youth, youth unemployment, and this is clearly something that is incompatible with a credible growth model in, in, in Europe. So those are the things to tackle, a huge change in our economy and in our social structure that has to be done in what you know, um, uh, was, called, was recalled solidarity. I would call it more like fairness, you know, the sense of fairness that as you move away from what we are used to be to a new uh, uh, stage of development of our society, this transition, and usually where you get caught in the complexity is how you make the transition, then you have to do it in a fair way. And that is uh, a fair way across country, a fair way across the population, and a fair way across generation, mm -hmm. that is. That's, you have all laid out a, a, the, the broad, a kind of comprehensive 
challenging set of things that we need to do, and you all are in a remarkable ag agreement about it. And you all say it's going to take a long time, and it's, going to, it's, it's tough, and it has to be done in a fair way. Minister Vanakere, I want to just push a little bit on the politics of this, though. You all agree on this agenda, but it is politically difficult. And when you are sitting in, in your Eurogroup Euro meetings, who is, who is running this? Is it really the happy, clappy, you know, we're all in this together, or are actually some players perhaps more central than others? I mean, you know, what is the, uh, what's the dynamic of the politics? I promise you I will be very straightforward about this. The law on gravity, where is the law on gravity voted? In what, ca in what capital? There is a lot of us, and Guido said, uh, Guido said he, uh, Germany is a modest country, and I know Guido as being a modest man at least, but all politicians, <laughs> all politicians, in yes, the 21st... I hope, huh? the reporters yeah. at home. I hope I'm, on, I, I'm on record here. <laughs> uh, no, all politicians need to have the modesty to recognize that some of the <coughs> mechanisms, they have something of the character of the law of gravity or other physical laws. So if you see some consensus, probably it is because a lot of things are plain to see. It is not necessarily plain to explain it to your audience, to your public opinion. <coughs> and uh, uh, Goethe already said the, the, the citizen is like the voter. He is like a sick man who is in his bed and, thinks, and, th and he thinks that things are going to get better by changing sides. And it is true that you have an alternance in, in politics. You explain and then the next guy pr probably has to deal with the same realities. All this to say that when you ask the question on dominance, in fact, what we have to recognize as European politicians, that probably the last two years we have been progressing more than the 18 years before that since Maastricht, probably. But it was unfortunately not by design, by uh, tremendous political will, but it was probably pushed by crisis and by lack of good alternatives. So I'm not saying that politicians do not choose their path. Uh, I, I'm not saying that politicians cannot be wrong because if, if you would have no liberty, you would not be able to make mistakes. And we do, do make mistakes, but most of the time, the discussion on dominance is more about, has everybody understood where we are? And of course, one has to take into account the differences between our countries. And I agree with those who said, be careful with the word solidarity because in, in many respects it is very often well understood self-interest. And that is something that that knowledge has, has uh, grown w at least within the European leadership. Unfortunately not enough within the European uh, populations and public opinions. People seem to think we're giving money to the Greeks, while very often we're lending money to the Greeks, which is not exactly the same. And uh, there is, of course, <laughs> there is, of course, no, no, there is an aspect of effort and shared effort, and I'm not going to say that the AAA countries, and, and Guido is not the only one, the other AAA countries, Finland, uh, Austria, uh, the Ho Holland, etc., they all put their AAA at stake. So you cannot say that this is uh, nothing to them. So when they do that, it is an act of solidarity, but in the same time, it is well understood that the European project, which is an economic project, but not only an economic project, because it's in history of a, of a continent that has chosen not to go to war with each other, but to, to work together. Uh, and it's important to, to keep, to keep that, that spirit alive and to make sure that uh, uh, these, these aspects are, are put forward to, to a public opinion who has it more and more difficult to understand that there is a, 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 an advantage for them uh, to stay within, within that uh, log of, logic of communality. Thank you. That's, that's very interesting. And I'm going to turn to you now, Minister Vestavel, and then one more, one, I'm going to open to questions in just a second. But this, this view that in it's, it's giving to Greeks... It's bailing out, it's, it's hard-earned German cash bailing out profligate people in the periphery. I mean, that is a view held by some in your country. Uh, and you gave a very eloquent, um, you, you quoted Thomas Mann, you gave a very eloquent view of, of Germany and European Germany. Is there a tension 
between those two in Germany, and how will it be resolved? I think <clears throat> in every country in Europe, you have politicians uh, which you wouldn't like to have. Um, so I think that's, that's normal. And of course, every quote in this direction, every arrogant quote uh, from Germany is reported European-wide. And then some people think this is the mood uh, in Germany. And the opposite is the truth. I mean, just imagine Germany guarantees with one national budget of a complete year. One national budget of a complete year. This is the guarantee, the size of our guarantees we put on the table. And all these decisions has been taken in Germany with a majority minimum 80% of the MPs. And after three years of fiscal discipline, we started at home first, of solidarity, of structural reforms, of being criticized and sometimes attacked in a very unfair way. There is no upcoming populist party in Germany. There is no mood in the German opinion against Europe. Every pro poll proves us that there is a clear pro-European spirit in our country. And I think this is something which we should realize. And I'm very grateful for what the German taxpayers did. But I'm also very grateful as a European patriotist, patriot. I'm very grateful, for example, what Portugal did, what Spain did. I have been the day before yesterday in Madrid. I have been this morning in Lisbon and discussed this with the government there, what Ireland did, and also and especially what Greece did. Don't think that we in Germany do not feel solidarity with the young unemployed people. Don't think that we do not feel sympathy with so many families who are suffering now. But we are convinced if we will not continue on the path of reforms, sustainable reforms, we will not resolve this crisis, we will probably help for a few hours, probably some days, but we will not give the answer in times of globalization to new centers of power. This is now the time where Europe has to understand that we are not any longer the center of the world, that there are upcoming centers of power and their economic success has one consequence, political, social, and economic participation. And this is the reason and what I'm telling really every day at home in my own country, to my own citizens, to my own people, in the parliament, in my own party, wherever, in the government, wherever. I always tell them, in Europe, Germany may be relatively big. In the world, we are relatively small. And I have this, if you allow me, this little bon mot, which it reminds me to what uh, Stephen and knows him, uh, like I know him very well. This is Jean Asselborn, the former, uh, the, I'm sorry, the, for, the foreign minister of Luxembourg. And he's, he's really a very experienced foreign minister of Luxembourg. And he told me uh, when I started uh, my office how he has been in China for his introductory visit. And he stood in a press conference together with the Chinese foreign minister. And he said in this press conference, Excellency, Mr. Minister, we, we too, we are now representing 
one quarter of the population worldwide. <laughs> and sometimes I think we do not understand what kind of change we have to handle in the world. And this is why I think Europe is more than the answer to the darkest chapter in history. Europe is our life insurance in times of globalization. It's also a cultural community in which we live. Thank you. I think I have many more questions, but I think I will save some of those for later, and I'm now going to open it to the floor because I'm sure this has, uh, will provoke many interesting questions. Please keep them short or your comments. I will cut you off if they're too long. <laughs> Gentlemen there, six rows back. Yes. Michele Ozza from UCM European Chamber, uh, an organization representing businesses. To simplify the explanation of the rules of living together in Europe, let's imagine a basic social concept, a family. A family uh, where we have many brothers and sisters. If one brother starts to think or act in his own interest only, this affects the others too. And if the other brothers and sisters think that he's seeking his own interest only, then this will undermine the solidarity and the mutual help to each other. So, to remind the governments, when they make their policies, like some are doing, with the populistic or nationalistic policies, they should remember that Europe is much more than just a geographic concept, a political or economic union, it's a family. Thank you. Thank you. I doubt anyone would disagree with that on the board. Yes. No, I, 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 I tend to agree uh, uh, because uh, I don't know whether you know uh, uh, how much money, for instance, Spain has put on the table for Greece. 25 billion euros in an economy that is having uh, you know, difficulties, sufferings. And I think that it has to do to the uh, to the uh, concept that the concept that I mentioned before, the concept that I mentioned before is uh, you know that we have a sh common view, that we have to share a project, and I think that uh, in order to understand why, for instance, when there is a relief a relief program for Greece, Spain or Italy, contribute more than other countries, is because for instance in order to fund uh, these 25 billion euros. Spain has to pay more than other countries in terms of cost of funding of, funding of this money. So this is something that uh, sometimes we overlook, eh? but I think that gives you an idea about, uh, well, uh, that uh, the concept of solidarity is perhaps there, it's implicit and embedded in what we are doing, but that simultaneously, well, we have to take into consideration that some countries are making important efforts, not only in terms of austerity, but also in terms of contributing to uh, try to relieve the difficulties of other countries. So uh, it's not only Germany, if you allow me to say. I, only, I, am, I, want, I, I like to be modest. I only uh, brag about the Spanish national team of football. Uh, <laughs> you imagine why. Uh, uh, but uh, but uh, uh, you know, uh, the point is that uh, not only Germany, not only the AAA-rated countries are making contributions for the future of the Eurozone. Other countries that have even uh, more difficult situations are making a contribution because we think that we are in, a, in, in the same boat and that we share the same project. Thank you. Yes, of course. Uh, I think the <coughs> metaphor of a family is a good one, but I think it's only half of a story. I think it's right asking uh, old brothers and sisters not to be behaving selfishly, but uh, also you want to make sure that nobody goes out and uh, go nuts and spend all your money. Uh, so I think that has to be a balance. Uh, and I think what we're doing in Europe is exactly that, making sure that everybody takes responsibility to be well behaved and not selfish. And I think the two things go together. Yeah. Robin, you, are, um, you put your hand up and I can't resist now that we have the family metaphor, um, what's, uh, what's the deal with the brother or the sister in the UK? When he was, when he was laying up that question, I just thought it was, it was coming like a laser to the UK, but it didn't. It, 
It went off in a beautiful, uh, in a beautiful pan to, to European integration. I don't know, maybe the UK is the prodigal son. If, if, uh, the UK may be the prodigal son if we're lucky. Um, uh, look, from my point of view, both as a Brit but also as a European, um, I think the EU is about national interests. Hopefully it's about shared national interests. And so far it has proved to be about shared national interests. Um, and I think that has been the amazing and wonderful achievement. It was, as, as Guido Vestavella said, at one point, the end of the Second World War, the unification of Europe, and ultimately then the unifying of, of West and East. And now it's about globalization. So I think it's about shared national interest. But let's not forget, when you get to a budget negotiation, it's not just the Brits. Uh, uh, everyone is fighting for their share of this, that, and the other. Same on trade. I think what's interesting is that the deeper level of integration that's likely to accompany, that is accompanying uh, this crisis of the, of the single currency is going to need a, a, a much deeper level of political uh, responsibility and connectivity between politicians negotiating on the behalf of Europe and populations that need to be taken along. I'm relatively optimistic. Um, I think that uh, populism is not turning out to be uh, as bad as perhaps some people had feared uh, a, year, a year or so ago. But I think engaging national parliaments is going to be the bridge uh, that's going to be needed between the reality of national interests and hopefully uh, uh, the reality of, of shared national interests at the same time. Even in the UK, I think there's an awareness of this. And you heard in David Cameron's speech, he's trying to calibrate uh, a realization that the UK is going to have a tough time if it's out there by itself, but uh, a fear that at least in the UK, there hasn't been the shared sense of being part of a family. Uh, the UK has taken a much more utilitarian view. But I don't think the UK is way off on the edge. It's part of a spectrum. We might be on the far end of the spectrum, but there is a spectrum. This, this, is, this is where the Federalist Belgian takes the floor <laughs> and says, this is a different view than what a lot of people in Europe think. What we heard here was, we, have a w w we, we are a market. What we are prepared to say is, we have a market, but we are not a market. We are more than that. Uh, it's, it's not only about tackling free trade issues or, or things like that. It's also a project that deals with one of the the realities of the world of today, we're all too small to make a real difference on the global issues today. And we're not only talking about the Euro crisis, but climate change, uh, peace, uh, demographics, things like that. Every country individually is too small to make uh, a difference on its own. And uh, it is only by, by, by cooperating that you can, uh, can make the difference on the, on the political level on all the issues that are besides the, the whole idea of having a good market functioning well, uh, are, I think, more crucial for a lot of citizens of the 21st century than, than only a free trade logic. I, I don't think I, okay, did did I say the word free market? The, the, the minute market? you let the, the, British, the British side of this thing, this could take over the whole thing. I'm, I'm not going to let that. Two very interesting perspectives. I suspect some people, I, whether shared national interest is goes beyond market or not beyond market is I think a sort of okay. is, is part of the issue. But let's, it's a let's bit of a straw man. I think a straw man um, of the market. Mr. Gurria, you've been very patient. I think if you would not have a uh, sense of shared self-interest of the national interest, you would not be able to put together this alliance that is Europe today. Why? Because solidarity can be a fleeting uh, sentiment. And uh, a change in government can produce less solidarity or more solidarity. You have a, to have objective indicators of why it is in the best interest of each one of the countries to maintain the union and to go forth. And that includes, by the way, the UK. I think uh, if there is a, a referendum in the UK in 2015 or in 2017, whatever, by that time we'll have five more years of integration, the UK, of course, is going to find it absolutely in their own interest to stay within, and they will. You know, I have absolutely no doubt about that. But because it will be in their interest, and every one of the countries uh, makes that bet every day, regardless of the you know, increasing feeling of, of belonging to the same project. I, uh, when I was 18 years old, that was some time ago, um, in Mexico, in the Federal Electricity Commission, I was working on a bond issue in Europe, in European units of account. This is not the ECU or the, uh, the, 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 the snake or whatever. The, it's a very, very, very far. And this is 43 years ago. Uh, the, 44 years ago, Mama? Was it there? Yeah. <laughs> 
the Europeans were already trying to get the common currency. They were doing, an, you know, a common, uh, you had to wait 14 different currencies in order to calculate the payment yeah, of interest. Yeah. You're already doing that 14 years ago. It's admirable what the Europeans have done, but they skipped a few phases. For example, they went to the common currency uh, without necessarily going to the banking union and going to the budgetary union. Now they're picking up, they're filling in the gaps. Uh, let me just say the following for Europe. Right. The question of Europe is the scaffolding, okay? Europe is always reinventing itself. Europe is always strengthening itself. Europe is always finding new institutions, modernizing itself, if you will, but it's covered with a scaffold, you know? And then uh, it's, it's dusty and it's noisy and you can't see, but then when you remove the scaffolding after three or four years, you stand in awe. It's the Duomo in Milan or the cathedral in Köln or whatever. This is, the, the organizations of Europe are like that. The only thing you cannot uh, blame Europe for is being too fast. They take their time. Thank you. <laughs> Next question. Um, uh, lady here, three rows back. We had a lot of good things. I would like to ask the auditory, how and why can you accept politicians who, don't, who do not know anymore what is man and woman and are blaspheming God into the face every day and practice abominable things? Thank you very much. We might go straight on to another question. Yes, uh, gentlemen here, three rows from the front. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Gurria, you explained to us uh, the problem of competitiveness, that productivity is the cause of the problem if productivity rises or rises less than the wages. Um, are, one, my question is, are the capital markets bashing the wrong people? They are bashing politicians and countries. Should they not bash enter uh, enterprises and uh, unions because they are the social partners who are agreeing on the wages normally. Uh, very fast, Zani. Uh, let yeah. me just say, I think this is critical. This is a very important point. The ones that did the wage settlements and the arrangements in the, the, that, uh, in order that were higher than the productivity were the companies and the unions, the two, okay? Perhaps even the governments who either promoted it or tolerated it or maybe encouraged it, okay? So nobody is innocent here, but clearly the private sector has a very, very serious responsibility. And they are the ones also who now have to participate. Now, what is the difference in the culture? What happened in Germany, again, and in some other countries, but mostly in Germany, there was a very clear understanding between the unions, the private sector, and the government that if you kept the wages moderate, uh, below the rise in the productivity. Everybody gains because you gain more market share, you export more, your, your, your products will be cheaper, whatever, okay? Now, if you add some technology, some innovation, whatever, as they have done, uh, it, make, it makes even better. The others are now correcting because the, you know, the situation is unsustainable. And then last but not least, the question of who finally uh, uh, has to take the decisions. In the end, yes, it's the companies, yes, it's the unions, but it's also the government in there. Let me just give you one information. Today, in order to correct the imbalances within Europe, all these countries here have adjusted their, um, their current accounts, okay? Except Germany. Germany's current account is like Johnny Walker, you know? It's still going strong, yeah? And uh, so... <laughs> So the question is, uh, perhaps that part we have to focus on, because of course the question of, of uh, to what extent can Germany now help a little bit in the efforts that the other countries are doing in order to compensate. It's not that we will Thank all become Germans, uh, but uh, they are the big guy, and the, maybe uh, therefore uh, they can uh, uh, do a little bit more. Thank you. I'm, in the interest of getting more questions, I will not ask you to respond to that. Um, uh, gentleman there, yes, in the white shirt or white sweater. I'm, I am very short-sighted, but it's something light-colored. Me too. My name is Fernando Morales de la Cruz. 
Um, I'm the father of two European daughters. I was born in Guatemala. And in Guatemala, which is an underdeveloped country, we say, well, if you get an education, you have it made. Well, 30 years ago, they used to say that in Spain, and many people who have great education don't have a job. So the question is for, to the politicians, how do we inspire these young people to make themselves their own job? I used to live in New Delhi. And in New Delhi, one thing I learned when I arrived, they said, you know, we have Gandhi, but we also have nuclear weapons. But the most important weapon we have <laughs> is that we have to work. We cannot wait for anybody to solve our problem, because if we don't do it ourselves, nobody else will. And that goes for hundreds of millions of Indians who have to feed themselves in whichever way possible. So my question is very tricky, because I think that the problem in Europe and this is what I used to think when I was living in New Delhi, is lack of inspiration, not among these people, because they do have their goals and they are doing it, but among millions and millions of Europeans, including perhaps my own daughter, who just turned 18, who doesn't see what Europe is and doesn't understand what it can become. And of course, it's very difficult for her because Mr. Vesterveli doesn't come to give her class every day. You know, he can't. <laughs> He's busy. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm, I, I, you raise a very important point. And I, if I might just broaden it, because I think this question, and we, we mentioned, you, you all mentioned, and I mentioned the, the scale of the youth unemployment issue, and if you sort of put, put this together, the, the young people of Europe, um, their aspirations, their inspirations, what needs to be done and what do they need to do? I think that's an that's a sort of important theme that you highlighted very well, and maybe Minister Vestervelo, I'll, I'll start with you and then to the other two ministers, three ministers. Um, what, what, what can you do? Surely the current situation where you have so many young people not working, not able to work in some cases, maybe not inspired, but what, this is a huge, huge cost to this continent, surely. Just uh, please allow me just to uh, make a remark before I coming back to your uh, question, uh, to your uh, remark uh, answering the first question of the audience. Uh, I thought a bit about uh, this... Um, this description of a family, Europe as a family. And I came to the conclusion, I think, what Louis said, uh, we sit in the same boat or we are in the same boat is a bit better. Because if you want to use this uh, description, a family, the second question is, whose father, whose mother? <laughs> and you can imagine that I wouldn't like this <laughs> for many reasons. My serious point is that I wanted to say, I think your question is personally for me the key question. Uh, because I think a social and democratic stability um, will not work, will not stay sustainable, reliable, without young people in jobs without that they have the personal conviction, I can make it. No one guarantees me that if I'm lazy that I have success, but I have fair chances and it doesn't depend where I come from, from which country in Europe, which parents I had, where I was born, I can make it. Sometimes this is described as the American dream. I think it's also a European dream. It's part of our success story. And therefore, I think, once again, with all modesty, my personal conviction is I'm not here to, to give any advice to, to politicians of, of other uh, countries. But my personal conviction is uh, that we have to convince the young generation to widen their horizon, whether they are in an academic career or, for example, they need vocational training. So these academic debates are too limited the clear majority of the people, they need perspectives in normal jobs, 
in non-academic jobs. For example, this is the reason why Germany offered, we're just offering it, to tell our friends in Europe what excellent experiences we had in our history with our system, vocational training, um, dual education system. I don't, I'm not sure if I translated it correctly, but I think it's understood. Mm -hmm. So the combination between theory and practice. Uh, the qualification of the young generation. And if I would, please allow me just to say this, and I, I don't want to, to sound like the teacher, but if I would be a young girl or young man now, like you said your daughter is, probably you were very international and you, you told this her and uh, your, your children, I think an international orientation by learning languages is absolutely important. Absolutely important. If I look back to my time when I was young, this was not the case for everyone. Uh, it was a privilege of the better schools, uh, which I couldn't visit in those days. So I think it is very important that we convince and tell our young people, learn languages are interested, be interested in the world, try to widen your horizon. And it is right what you said about competitiveness, labor laws, and, and all this is true. Of course, it's true that we had in the last decades successful governments, not only now, also our predecessors, but when we really ask for the reason for the German success story, after we have been 10, 12 years ago, the sick man of Europe, which was, I think, the I cover of your magazine, <laughs> um, if I remember correctly. I mean, the main reason is that the German economy is based with a priority on medium and smaller sized companies, which gives you a lot of flexibility to new developments on the markets in the world. And secondly, that in the 90s, when those companies were blamed for it, they weren't irritated. They went with investments all over the world. They invested in China, and they were attacked because they invested in China. They invested in India, in Latin America, they invested in Africa, Nigeria, South Africa. So these normal companies in Germany, they worked earlier than others on the international network. And this is the reason why they can sell their products now in these markets and why they are well known. And this is probably which is becoming from more and more of more and more importance uh, in our days for the young generation. So this international orientation is, I think, the key answer to your key question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to run out of time, I know, but lady here. Yes. Men in the back. Hi. Um, okay. As a, student from the, a college student from the United States, um, I was just wondering, um, compared to the United States, um, why has Europe in general had more have had more success in terms of austerity and that fis uh, fiscal responsibility. Um, who would like to take that? How about you take that? Maybe because the U.S. hasn't tried it, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think Zani's uh, uh, comment is absolutely uh, serious. Uh, I think uh, in the United States, uh, a debt was built up, which today is unsustainable. Uh, it's uh, going beyond 100% of their GDP. And the problem that you have today in the United States is that the governance is so difficult, the, the, the political situation is so polarized that it's very difficult to arrive at what is a very obvious uh, and very necessary consensus. You have to do something about not only the deficit of the year, 
but also the accumulation of debt. Because as far as the eye can see, you're going to get into beyond 100% uh, before you start stabilizing and then coming down. And the question is, how long does the market or the markets uh, keep giving the United States a lot more room, a lot more tolerance, a lot more patience? Well, maybe for some time, but don't test it because if you find out the answer to my question, it'll be too late, okay? Thank, thank um, you, Anka. Uh, so uh, I would say I hope that besides, you know, having kicked the can to May, uh, in May, or as soon as possible, they actually arrive at a consensus which will give a medium and long-term context in which they're going to address this issue and austerity is going to be in the cards. Already it is in the cards because some taxes have been raised and then a lot okay. of expenses are going to be cut. So they're going to be in the club. It's inevitable. Can I stop you there? Just simply because we have a big enough task discussing the future of Europe. If we start getting onto the future of the United States, it, uh, we, I'm sure we would all disagree and it would be, but it's a, a terrific question, thank you. Um, there was a gentleman there who's had his, yes, had a card up for a long time. Ich habe kürzlich eine Nachricht gelesen, dass Nigeria vor die Wahl gestellt wurde von Großbritannien und die USA, ist, Entwicklungshilfe zu kürzen. Ist, ist diese Frage über Europa, über die Eurozone? Ja, genau. Ja, sie ist gut. Das ist, gut es geht auf zurück auf... Das Mikrofon funktioniert nicht. Doch, funktioniert. Doch? funktioniert. Oder, äh, also Nigeria wurde von Großbritannien und die USA vor die Wahl gestellt, Entwicklungshilfe zu kürzen, gekürzt zu bekommen oder die homosexuellen Ehe einzuführen. Das ist deswegen bekannt geworden. Danke, ich hab, weil Sie, ich hab, warum lassen Sie mich nicht ausreden? Weil diese, wir haben wenig Zeit, diese Diskussion, ich tut mir leid, ist über die Zukunft Europas. Ich, ich, Sie haben sicher sehr viele Sachen zu sagen, aber die, ich möchte wirklich die Diskussion darauf äh, behalten. Um, turning to the next question. Um, yes, gentlemen, gentlemen there. As long as it's about Europe. Is maybe uh, G Germany what I want to mention. Also, als Lehman Brothers pleite ging, war sie AAA, das müssen wir mal sagen. Und diese Vorschläge, die, sie, die ich heute Abend gehört habe, das gibt, das gibt einen Crash vom Euro, das ist ein ganz klarer Fall. Da fehlt Innovation und Kreativität, das ist klar. Und das Wachstum, immer im Wachstum ist einfach, da vergeht es einfach nicht mehr. Deutschland hat die Waffenexport in den letzten fünf Jahren verdoppelt weltweit. Das ist ein Wachstum, aber was ist das für ein Wachstum? Die Lebensqualität, die Lebens... We are a democracy, we can say questions and we can say comments. This is a democracy. You can, but if you could keep also, it brief, please keep it brief, because there are a lot of people who want to kurz. ask questions. Das Wachstum führt schlussendlich in der Zerstörung der Lebensgrundlage der Natur. Und wenn, und wenn man ein, ein Wachstumsbeschleunigungsgesetz einsetzt, dann geht es nicht um die Lebensqualität, sondern es geht schlussendlich um die Erhöhung Vielen der, der Rendite. Danke. Und jetzt ist die Frage, die wenn, wenn Sie wollen, Sie, dass der Minister Ich möchte wissen, weshalb ja, die danke, Reichen in Deutschland danke, fast danke. keine Steuern bezahlen Vielen und weshalb Dank. die Zinsen 45 Milliarden, das ist der zweitgrößte Posten in Deutschland. Die Frage nach Westerwelle, was ist das für ein Chaos? Ich möchte Ihre Frage beantworten. Ich bin sorry, aber Minister Westerwelle, Sie würden gerne darauf antworten? Ich denke, ich muss. Sehen Sie, da ist ja mehr Propaganda in Ihren Fragen und mehr Unterstellung als, äh, als äh, wirklich Wissen. Und ähm, ähm, es hat ja keinen Sinn, aber ich will nur ein einziges Beispiel nennen. Äh, der Anteil der Waffenexporte an, der, an den Gesamtexporten Deutschlands ist im letzten Jahr 2000, nein, im Jahr 2011, da haben wir die Zahlen schon für, ist im Jahr 2011 so niedrig gewesen wie seit 2002 nicht mehr. Also ich muss Sie einfach bitten, ja, aber ich muss Ihnen muss ihn einfach nur sagen, ich möchte auch jetzt einfach nur darum bitten, dass Sie sich selber die Freude machen, alles, was Sie hier auch äh, an Behauptungen in Ihrer Frage hineingebracht haben, einfach nochmal durch einen einfachen Blick ins Internet zu überprüfen und dann 
glaube ich, sieht es anders aus. Danke. Uh, I have just been given a sign that we have five minutes. Gentlemen here, you've had your hand up for a long time. I'm so sorry. We're not going to be able to get to all of you. Third, third row. I just have a small question to Mr. Mr. Grilly. Have you asked a question already? No. I did, yes. You did. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. We can't have two <laughs> questions. I said I was short-sighted. Sorry. Uh, yes, at the back there. Yes. Sorry. Tough leadership. Sorry. <laughs> Oh, oh, well, I will try in English because of the others. My English is not so good and my question is simply, do you believe really that we, well, we, the Swiss, we are in a good place, but you, the European Union, you can become a real family with all these different languages and these different cultures? Thank you. We're trying our best here with two. I, uh, um, yes. Später, später, whenever you want. No, uh, actually, no, maybe, Minister Greeley, wait. The others start. first. When, I whenever think you want. Difference in language and well, Switzerland is a great place mm -hmm. to start. You know, you have many different languages, right? <laughs> so, I don't think that languages per se are a barrier. Uh, actually, is a richness, uh, uh, and having a different culture is in fact a richness. So, the political challenge and our economic challenge is to continue to make that richness to be an asset you can profit on. Of course. Uh, we know that uh, there is just more than just uh, languages, uh, as uh, we know that our uh, social institution, economic institution are still fragmented, uh, but we have been doing a great job in trying to integrate them. So I think that they have to go both way. You know, countries and different culture have to find a way to merge, and uh, this is uh, a, a complex, co uh, complex uh, um, process. But this is uh, the game we are playing, and I think I think we are going to be, and we are, uh, showing to be successful. I, I would simply like to add the, 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 the truth that before the United States of America became a singular and not a plural, that it was something where you use the verb, the United States is going to do this or do, a lot of decades have passed in history. And I know that not everybody shares the view uh, of moving on towards more integration, and I respect that, and I think that a lot of us can go a long way without thinking that one day Europe will really become a singular and not a plural, but uh, I do believe that uh, on the condition that we also take care of the democratic aspects of this project, we can do it. The only thing is today, I think, there is more conviction in what you can call political or economical or financial elites on the, on the shared uh, interest of doing things together, and it is not enough shared by the people. And you cannot make a project without the people or against the people. So what we def desperately need is more pedagogy and less demagogy. So more people explaining that this is really not only a question of, of elites wanting to go forward towards integration, but it is also a dream that can for real families, because I don't know if the comparison with family v dangerous, huh? but real families, real families have an interest to be on a continent where the political energy, the economical energy is uh, much more combined. And I'm convinced of that, but it, it will take uh, more democracy as well, and so, for example, a stronger European Parliament, for example. Thank you. Robin, very briefly, because well, we just, are... Uh, even for a bit, I think there are three reasons why Europe actually will succeed. Number one, no choice. Uh, <laughs> we've got no choice, and I include the UK in that, by the way, in having to be part of this to succeed in the kind of changing world that's been described. Secondly, let's not forget shared values. And I think the kind of values that Europe represents all European nations, tolerance, democracy, even coalition-type po uh, politics, and a social market. And again, I include the UK in this, with a very large national health service, which is nothing like anything you'll find in the US. Uh, thirdly, the one of the key strengths that Europe has is the rule of law. 
There's a reason why in London we find so many people from around the world, the great emerging economies, buying houses over in Europe. They trust their money over here. They trust they will get a fair uh, uh, shake in the courts of law. And I think actually the rule of law, the stability of our political system is a huge strength in Europe. Watch the Ryder Cup. When Europe gets together, I'm not a big golf player, but I watch it once a year, twice a year. The Ryder Cup, that's Europe together, very strong. I'll take your word for it. Thank you. Minister de Guindos, and then you can... No, very, very, very briefly. Uh, I think that diversity uh, is not a weakness. It's a, it's a strength. And, uh, well, we are diverse. We have different cultures. We have different languages. Uh, we have different traditions. And uh, despite all that, we have been able to create uh, institutions, and we have a common project. And I think that this is the most clear sign and the most clear signal about the political will that uh, we have put in the future of the Euro and the future of the, of the European Union. We are diverse, and this diversity, as I have told you before, is our strength. Thank you. <laughs> Minister Westerwelle, I've had a large sign saying what, we have one minute left. I give you the last word for one minute. <laughs> or less. Um, or less. No, I agree to everything what has been said with one exception that we do not have a choice about Europe. We have a choice. We always have a choice. But if we wouldn't, we are not forced to live in Europe and we are not forced to live in the European Union. But if we wouldn't have the European Union, we should immediately start to work on it, to found a European Union. Immediately. It's urgent. And uh, this is my first uh, remark. This is also what I think we have to discuss in Great Britain. Uh, this is not a question that someone is, uh, without any alternative, forced to have Europe. If you want to have joint benefits, it's necessary to understand you also will have joint obligations. These are two sides of the same coin. And what you said about the differences in Europe, languages you mentioned, I mean, this is just a question of the perspective. Here. In Europe, we think there what, what big differences we have between North and South and West and East. Just go to China and look to Europe from their perspective. There are so little, so small differences in Europe. We are a community, a cultural community, more than one thinks. Like it or not, we have more in common beyond all borders than probably one thinks in this hall at the moment. If you go to China, there are more native languages than in Europe. If you go to India, there are more different native languages than in Europe, and so on and so on. We can make it, and a bit more optimism for the young generation is necessary, young men. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Technically, I am supposed to summarize this discussion. I am not even going to try. It was a spectacularly interesting, energetic discussion. We used metaphors, scaffolding, family, boats. I'm not sure which I prefer, but I'm inspired by this discussion about the future of Europe. It was really terrific. Thank you all so very much. Thank you.